I can't believe it's the end of July already, and that means it's been two full months since I did my last garden tour video. So let's have a look and we'll see what's changed since then. Hey everyone, how's it going and welcome back. So back in May, we did a garden tour where I showed you around the whole place, but this time I thought we'd focus just on the areas that have changed or developed in the last couple of months and no more so than here, which used to be lawn, but has now become our no mow meadow. I'm staggered by how well it's got on this year. In only a few short months, the diversity of plant life has just exploded. Even just in this small area alone, we've got self-heal with these little purple flowers. We've got little white flowers that I have to admit I'd never heard of until they popped up here and I had to Google them. They're called Stellaria. They're scattered throughout this and they look absolutely gorgeous. There's a whole mix of different types of grass, there's buttercups, and even in a couple of areas, we've got some white oxeye daisies. I didn't expect they would come through. And although they've passed a little bit now, and there's only a couple of them, I'm hoping that they're gonna set seed over the next couple of months, and we'll have more and more over the next few years. But it's not only the plant life that's really exploded, it's the diversity of wildlife, particularly insects. This whole place is buzzing with bees, there's butterflies of different types. We've got ladybirds all over the place, which is a real positive. And we've also got spiders, but they're spiders that make these little kind of globe webs that are dotted all over the place and they look brilliant. So all in all, it's been really, really positive, but it hasn't been 100% perfect. If you've watched any of my previous videos, you'll know that we let the entire garden go to a no-mow meadow, except for some little grass paths that we cut through. But you might notice it looks a little bit different behind me and there's quite a bit less of the long grass. But to understand why we've made that change, we need to cut back to a couple of days ago. So although it's nice and bright at the moment, that was not the story earlier on this morning or for the last couple of days for that matter. For the last couple of days, it has chucked it down with rain almost constantly and this is the result. So rather than having nice tall grass seed heads and flowers, what's happened is that the water has caused all of the grasses to fall really flat and for me, it now looks really messy, particularly around this area. And what I feel now is that rather than the area looking kind of beautifully natural and a little bit wild, it's gone over the tipping point and it now just looks like it's unkempt and as though the garden isn't looked after properly. The other thing is that the long grasses then fall inwards into the grass paths that we've cut. And particularly on a day like today, where even though it's dried up, the garden itself is still soggy, it means two things, wet feet and wet trousers. So here's what we've done. We've taken the area between the house and the orchard and we've carved out a dedicated block of long grass meadow. Otherwise, everything else has been cut to a shorter level and we've put a couple of crossing paths through it as well. It just looks that little bit neater, a little bit more kept and we're much happier with it. Now, I know that the areas that we've cut look really kind of brown and dead at the moment, but they're gonna come back to life in no time and they'll look great. They're already starting to show some green shoots. The other issue that it solved that was making the whole garden look really messy was that up against the hedges where the long grass would grow, it looked really, really untidy. So now that those are cut as well, it just looks that bit sharper. And in the orchard, we've kept the mown paths as before, but I went through the rest of the area with the strimmer and reduced the grass in height. Long enough to still look natural and to let some of the flowers come through, but short enough to be a bit more manageable and look a little bit more tended and neat. So it just goes to show it's always worth experimenting in the garden, particularly when it comes to something as easy as grass, because what's the worst that can happen? If you decide you don't like it, go over it with the mower. It's like a reset and it'll grow back again and you can change it again and things in the orchard are coming on really nicely as well. So I thought I'd give you a quick update on how the apples are getting on. 
So this is just one of the cooking apple trees that we've got in the orchard, and you can see that already the fruit is starting to set quite nicely. Over the last couple of weeks, the trees have started to shed some little apples. It's called June Drop, and it's standard. The trees do it every year where they cast off some excess fruit. If you've noticed it in your own garden, you don't need to worry about it. It's totally normal and it happens every year. So what I'm gonna to have to do this week is go through, collect these up, and I'm gonna see how many I can put in my hot composter without turning it into a kind of brewery or a still or something. Now, it's been about 17 years since I dealt with fruit trees back when I was in horticulture college, but there's one job that I remember that I need to do, and that's to thin out these apples. So what you would normally do is rather than leaving, say, on this truss, there's four apples, you would cut it down to two or ideally one fruit. That lets the tree put all of its energy into developing one good fruit. It also reduces the overall weight on the branches of the trees but I'm gonna to be totally honest with you. I don't have the time to do it this year and it's just not a priority job when I'm trying to look after the whole garden. So what I'm gonna do is leave them to their own devices this year and keep my fingers crossed and we'll see how they come out. So it's not only cooking apple trees that we've got in the orchard, we've also got two red eating apple trees that when we moved in last year had already finished and I only managed to get about two apples to taste, but they were absolutely delicious. So I'm delighted that these are setting fruit nicely as well this year. Hopefully they continue to develop and by the time it's ready to harvest, I'm gonna have loads of nice red eating apples. So let's go this way and we'll check out what's happening in the polytunnel. So here's how things are getting on in the polytunnel at the moment. If you watched my videos about six weeks ago where I was planting up cucumbers and tomatoes, the link's up here if you haven't already seen it, you'll see how well things have developed since then and they're looking really good, which is more than can be said for my polytunnel door. It got damaged a couple of days ago in the wind, but at the moment it's given me some much needed airflow, so I'm not complaining. But back to the fruit, everything is starting to set fruit nicely, which I'm really happy with, albeit most of it is still green because I planted everything a little bit late this season, so it's playing catch up. But you can see already we've got some tomatoes that are starting to colour up, so they'll be able to be harvested soon, which I'm looking forward to. My cucumbers are doing nicely also. I grew two different types, market more, which is a standard cucumber. We've got some fruit setting well for it. And also crystal lemon, which produces little spherical cucumbers. We've got some of those as well. They're doing nicely also. So all in all, I'm happy with the progress so far. So as well as the tomatoes and the cucumbers, the strawberries that I planted up into old dresser drawers have developed quite nicely also. All of these ones are the ones that I took as runners from my previous house, and these are first year plants. And what's been interesting is to see how their behavior has been very different to this one container here. These ones, because they're first year plants, haven't really produced any strawberries, but they are developing as plants. What they've done instead is they've produced these little runners. Normally what you would do is you could cut those runners off so that these plants will continue to develop and bulk up, but at the moment my priority is to increase numbers of plants. So I'm gonna plant those runners up so that I can increase numbers and have even more for next year, and then I can start prioritizing getting the plants bulked up to produce some real fruit. The flip side of it is this last drawer here. These are the four plants that are descendants of the strawberries of my grandma and grandpa's. And these plants are already a couple of years old and you can definitely see the difference. They've been producing fruit for me, albeit not very much, but it's been absolutely delicious. And I'm watching at the minute because there's one almost ripe strawberry that I'm keeping an eye on every day so that I can pick it when it's ready. All in all though, they're doing nicely, but I think they'll be even better next year. So that's everything in the polytunnel. Let's get out of the heat and find somewhere a wee bit cooler. So back in my May garden tour, I showed you the pond for the first time and mentioned that I'd bought some new aquatic plants to put in it. Well, since then, a couple of you have got in contact because you were wanting to know what I bought and why I bought it. So here's a quick rundown. For starters, rather than buying about 15 or 20 different types of aquatic plants, I decided to keep the palette quite small. I bought about five or six different types, but bought larger numbers instead. So what I've got here is I've got a marsh marigold. It's Caltha palustris. It forms just nice little sort of buttercup style yellow flowers. As well as it, I've got this, it's a yellow flag iris. It's 
Iris pseudocorus, and it's a variegated type. I think the leaves look really, really nice on it. And then behind it, I've got a kind of bulrush. It's Typha laxmanii. I've also got another one called Typha minima, but basically both of them are dwarf versions of a bulrush, because the last thing I need in here is a 15 foot high, six foot wide clump of bulrushes. But I do want the effect, and these do produce little bulrushes once they've flowered, which is really cool. So the benefit of these plants is threefold. For starters, they filter and reduce nutrients in the water, particularly in a wildlife pond. You want to keep the water nutrients quite low, otherwise you risk having a real algal bloom and the pond going very, very sort of soupy and green. So that's the first thing that they do. Secondly, down at the base where they're submerged in water, they provide little hidey holes for aquatic life to live in. It's great at the moment because we've still got the tadpoles that are developing into little baby frogs. And actually, if we have a look now, we might find a little baby frog. And there's one there. How cool is that? And as well as that, then the foliage provides a habitat for insects also. So as well as these marginal plants, I bought pretty much a standard uh, oxygenating weed to put in. And I also got some floating plants. We already had the water lilies, but as well as that, I've bought this. This is water soldiers or Pistia stratiotes. It's one of my favorite plants. It's just really cool. It's got buoyancy in its leaves, so it floats along the surface like a jellyfish. So like I said, rather than buying lots of different types, I opted for higher numbers of fewer different types. And you'll see that I've got them dotted around this pond, but it's not just this pond that I put these plants into. I put them into the pond in the secret garden as well. So let's go and check that out. So we're gonna keep on walking past the front garden because at this time of year, it doesn't really change that much, as nice looking as it is. However, we are gonna take one quick look at something because I was given it as a present and it's over here. I was given these plants by a very kind friend called Celia. Thanks Celia. These are echiums and she's given me five of them which I've just planted into the front garden. Now, if we come back and look at these in the future, this is probably going to be the last time where I have to be kneeling down because they are going to grow seriously tall, as in like 10, 15 foot tall and have big blue spires of flowers. But for now, they're just baby plants, but hopefully they're going to settle in and they're going to do really nicely. So onwards, like a promise to the secret garden. So we're in the secret garden at the front of the house, and this is our other pond, but it's got the same plants that I've just shown you. We've got the marsh marigold, the yellow flag iris, and the little mini bulrushes, and they're starting to work their magic on the water here as well. It's starting to clear, and I think it's looking a lot healthier. One other plant that we have though is this. It's Ranunculus flamula, not that easy to say. At the moment, for me, jury's out about whether I like it. We've got one here, we've got one in the corner, the little yellow flowers are nice, but it's kind of rangy and kind of floppy. But even if I don't like it, it is still contributing to creating a good ecosystem for wildlife. So, so I certainly won't be getting rid of it. I'm just not sure that I love it. I've also been putting in a little bit of work into trying to bulk up this area planted behind the pond to make it more lush. So we've got some anemones that are coming through that were already here, and this regersia as well, which is starting to push up through and should be flowering soon as well. So this is just a nice lush area at the minute. So there you have it. That's everything that's been happening over the last couple of months and what the garden looks like at the moment in July. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you haven't already seen them, check out these videos as well, because I think you might find them interesting. And until next time, see you later.